contrary to popular belief, I have not been in college for a decade. <laughs> for you here today unfamiliar with me, or for those who have no idea to what on earth I am referring, please allow me to explain briefly, as our time here is very limited. After high school, I took a very unconventional route, which kept me from the halls of academia for just over two years, at which point I returned. Two years behind my friends, two years behind on the social clock, two years behind cultural expectations, a reality that many close to me would never, ever let me live down. Most commonly saying, you do know that 10 years for an undergraduate degree does not warrant one a PhD. But, I repeat, I am not a Decadian. However, in many ways I wish that I would have committed 10 years to my undergraduate education. It's a controversial proposition in our culture, certainly, but because in many ways there's a part of me that feels like he's just now beginning to figure this whole thing out. With another six years at Bethany under my belt, perhaps then and only then would I be prepared to step out into the real world and make something of myself. And with certainty, as we are prone to confess, say, because of Bethany, this is what I have learned. This is who I am. And this is what this institution has made me. Isn't that what I'm supposed to be saying right now? Do not students at the microphone at these events think warmly and wholeheartedly their professors, administrators, and most especially the idea that is this institution, the idea that binds and glues and grafts this idea, this place together to which we all subscribe, for making them who they are presently at these junctures. But really, what is one supposed to do with these things anyway? If you haven't caught on yet, I like to ask a lot of questions, don't I? Especially those prickly kinds of questions which have no answers, so I hope that that suits your appetite for these things, because that's what I intend to deliver. In any case, I've experienced plenty of these uh, speeches to know that one's appetite for this is usually in the barcode of, well, uh, how much longer is this speaker going to ramble on? And I know what you're thinking. I don't have time for this. Precisely, and indeed, that's exactly the point. What time do we have? What time do we have for anything? Why do any of us have time at all? I experienced or witnessed the actualization of many stories and rumored whispers that circulated around this campus seasonally. For example, Dr. Eugene Bales, our provost, it was said, had this mythical tome hidden away somewhere in his office about philosophy in the West. Lo and behold, it was published during my time here. When I started, my friends and I, after American novel class with Dr. Van Passel or English novel class with Dr. Lewis, would congregate on the broken sidewalks drink coffee and deliberately delay our next daily commitments to continue fantastically intellectual, philosophical conversations about life, art, meaning. No one ever thought that those broken sidewalks around campus would ever be repaired, nor did they ever think our pretentious blowhard propensities would ever wear out. Lo and behold, they were repaired, and we are no longer loitering around the library doors. Lastly, our founding father, poor old Eric Carl Aaron Swenson, used to exist tucked away in the corner of campus. Thankfully, this righteous statuary was restored at the center, our ornamental keystone where he belongs. So it's hard not to believe that one has not been involved with an institution for a decade when events like these occur, when the mythic and the rumored become actual. I may not have been an Acadian, but that's exactly what I've been sharing with you today. It's on the theme of time. It seems natural for most commencement speakers to accept the microphone and utter the time-worn phrase, where does the time go? Well, I plan to look forward at the idea of what time any of us has left. After four years of studying philosophy, I've kind of settled on the one truth of existence, which is that the whole meaning of life can be discovered if one were to live as deliberately as my grandmother shopped for peaches at the supermarket. I want to live as deliberately as my grandmother shopped for peaches. It was a wonder to behold. With zen-like concentration, she would examine each one for the finest, tiniest imperfection. She would know which among the others in the basket had the potential to be perfect peaches. Peaches, a seemingly insignificant thing. Peaches. But she knew, for instance, that those peaches would pop my grandfather's breakfast cereal, would be on the dinner table that night, would be on the pile, would be going into the pie she was planning to make for her children and grandchildren. She spent a great deal of time hunting for the best in the bunch. An investment of time which I would never complain as I thought her cooking was heaven on earth. So the class of 2009, we got lucky, didn't we? What a climate encompasses us. We couldn't have picked a better time to enter the world. It's upset, depressed, the most time-honored traditions in, American, in the American spirit are bankrupt. 
And we are now charged to go out and change the world, make that world a better place. But why should we when it seems that a few bad apples have no desire to make the world a better place for us? Why work hard and with virtue? Why not give up? My classmates, I should request, go and invest your time in making the world a better, more habitable, more secure, and more pleasant place to live. I believe that most people never set out with the ambition that they're going to make the world worse for others. I think that we are ethically obligated to think such things. However, I further believe that most people do not spend their time making the world a better place either. They adopt a casual resignation and presume that others will take care of it for them. Today our world is a bleak, inhospitable, dirty, polluted, corrupt, recessed, depressed, and sad place to live. Kind of like my kitchen. Now, I don't know about you, but I am excited. I feel like I'm the type of personality that thrives when things are abysmally, catastrophically dismal, and not the other way around, quite like my kitchen. I mean, that when every dish in the whole kitchen is dirty, every pot and pan, they have food three months old, caked on to the bottom, and even you have discovered to, uh, a way to prove that the non-stick uh, pans are a marketing lie, it, it, it's more impressive to clean all of those dishes and achieve absolution than when it's just a butter knife and a bread plate. Now those are small potato wins compared to cleaning the whole kitchen, so I think the times we are living in are very much like my kitchen. Lots of dirty pots and pans, and I'm anxious to tackle them, as I am going to soak them, scrape them, and soak and dry them up. Things are ripe for revision. The status quo has dissolved. Think beyond our limits and do what has never been done before. Don't invest your time in making the world better by means of what has already been done. Be bold, be exceptional, be creative. Celebrate yourself and sing yourself. So what is it that you plan to do with your time after today? That is what we really must ask ourselves right now. But perhaps it's not too late for me. Perhaps my time has not yet expired. Perhaps, as will occur in a few short moments, I can delay the inevitable offering of my diploma and take out two, three, four, maybe five more majors here at Bethany. You know, who doesn't have the time for that, right? If I do, perhaps I can finally stay around Bethany long enough to actually make it through Dr. Vale's book. In conclusion, I would say, use your time to be radical, be cantankerous, be unique, be iconoclastic, be ingenious, be hopeful. I mentioned earlier that I have a devout relationship to writers. I majored in literature, theater, and philosophy in college, and so you see it goes without saying that I have an unnatural and sometimes unhealthy obsession with words. I majored in English, which means that not only do I possess this love of language and love for people who use language well, but I also know well enough that when other people have said what I would like to say far better than I ever could, you let them speak. I leave you, my fellow graduates, class of 2009, with a poem by Wendell Berry that is very near my head and my heart. Manifesto, the Mad Farmer Liberation Front. So friends, do something every day that will compute. Love the world. Work for nothing. Take all that you have and be poor. Love someone who does not deserve it. Denounce the government and embrace the flag. Hope to live in that free republic for which it stands. Give your approval to all that you cannot understand. Praise ignorance, for what man has not encountered, he has not destroyed. Ask the questions that have no answers. Swear allegiance to what is nighest to your thoughts. As soon as the generals and the politicos can predict the motions of your mind, lose it. Leave it as a sign to mark the false trail, the way you didn't go. Be like the fox who makes more tracks than necessary, some in the wrong direction. <coughs> Practice resurrection. <coughs> Thank you very much. Yeah.